Okay, we're talking about promoting transparency in marriage in this session, how to have a naked and unashamed relationship. And we said first that we need to acknowledge that men and women are created differently. And uh, we talked a little bit about that. Uh, secondly, we talked about we need to appreciate our different temperaments or personalities that God has given to us. Then we need to deal with past influences that can affect us and, and be, hold us in bondage to our past that would affect us in our present. Uh, I want to deal with something very practical in this fourth area that promotes transparency, and that is refining our communication skills. Uh, research shows that there are four vital parts to effective communication. The first is called the intent. The intent is the motive behind what we say. Now, I want to give you an illustration of what I mean by that. Uh, let's say years ago when I would go out and leave on a weekend, and Debbie was not traveling with me. She was at home with the boys at that time. And I come back home. We hadn't seen each other for a while. And Debbie, when I come up to her, she says, Sam, let's go take a walk and let's look at all the flowers and let's look at the trees. Let's just take a walk together. Now, because my personality is different, probably when I was flying back on the plane, I was thinking about all the things I had to do when I got back home. I probably made a list of things out for me to do and a list of things out maybe even for Debbie to do. She's shaking her head, yes. And... So when I got home, I'm thinking about everything I've got to get done. So when she says, let's go outside and take a walk and look at the flowers, what's she really asking me for? Time. She wants to spend some time with me. But I may be thinking to myself, being the insensitive husband that I am, I'm not thinking about that. All I'm thinking about is, hey, I don't have time to take a walk. I got this to do, this to do, this to do, you know. And she is saying, I want time with you. Now that brings us to the second point, the criteria. The criteria is the plan for accomplishing the intent. Debbie hid the intent. Her intent was to have time with me. But she didn't communicate that. What she did is she communicated in the criteria. Most people hide the intent and communicate in the criteria. The criteria then might have been in which she said, let's go outside and take a walk and look at the flowers. That's saying, this is what we'll do. What she really wanted was time alone. She hid that, thinking that I would understand that, but being the logical male brain that I am, I didn't perceive that in this illustration. So we might say to avoid miscommunication, make sure that the intent is clear. You have to make sure that you really are giving the intent of what you're asking for to make it clear. You can't make an assumption that the other person understands that because many times uh, they do not. To avoid miscommunication, you gotta make sure the intent is clear. Then you have the process. The process. You have the intent, the criteria. Thirdly, it's the process, and the process is important too. It's the manner in which you express yourself. Because researchers say that 55% of what people respond to and make assumptions about take place visually. That is, we communicate more visually than any other way. Facial expressions, hand expressions. There's a lot of communication going on through visual communication. I mean, ha can you remember ever maybe sitting in your favorite chair in your living room? You're sitting there minding your own business. Maybe you're reading a book or something, and your husband or wife walks up to you and looks down at you and says something like this, what's wrong with you? And you hadn't said a word. You're sitting there reading or doing something. What they're saying is, I can read you like a book. I know what you're thinking. And most of the time, they can. They can look at your face and they can see if something is bothering you, whether you're mad. You communicate very, very strongly visually. In fact, you've probably done this to your kids before. Don't look at me that way. I know what you're thinking. You know, maybe you've thought that even if you didn't say that. And many times you do know because, again, visual communication is a powerful part of communication. 38% of what people respond to make assumptions about take place through the sound of your voice. How you say what you say. Now, let me give you an illustration of this, too. This is important, too. Let's say years ago, back when I was working as an engineer, I would leave in the morning, i say 6, 6.30 in the morning, and I would go down to the job where I would be slaving away all day long for my wife and for my kids. I would be working very, very hard, and I would be at a job place working where my wife had it made. She got to stay home with the kids, amen? She didn't have to work. She didn't have a job, right? And she got to stay home with the kids. And so at 5 o'clock, when I got off from work, I would get in my car, drive home, and I'm thinking in my mind, 
Uh, you know, I bet my wife is going to roll out the red carpet for her king when I get home. I mean, when I drive up in the driveway, I'm probably going to be able to smell the meal outside that she's cooking for her king. And so I'm imagining this meal that's being cooked. I'm imagining this dessert that she's cooked for me. After all, I've labored hard all day long, and I've come home. Her king has arrived. I walk into the front door. I walk down through the hallway, look over in the dining room table. There's nothing on the table. I go into the kitchen, and she's got a few pots and pans just beginning to start supper. And I look over at her, and I say something like this. I thought we was going to have supper at 6 o'clock. Now, how is she probably going to respond to that? A lot of that depends on how I say it. Now, if I say, I thought we was going to have supper at 6 o'clock like that, she probably would say, maybe, something like this. Here's the pots and pans. Help yourself. <laughs> or McDonald's is right down the road. Go in and get you a burger if you'd like to, you know. Uh, but this brings us to the process or, or, the, or the way we... Uh, talk to each other in the tone of our voice. Now, uh, there's three different parts of this. The tone is the harshness of pitch of what you say. If I were to say, I thought we was going to have supper at 5 o'clock, that's pretty harsh. I wouldn't get by with that. Whereas if I said, I thought we was going to have supper at 5 o'clock, said it a lot softer, I might get by with that. <laughs> Debbie said, no, I wouldn't get by with that either. Um, the tempo is the speed of what you say. I thought we was going to have supper at 5 o'clock. I thought I could say it real fast. I could say it real slow. I thought we was going to have supper at 5 o'clock. Again, uh, the speed of what I say makes a difference too. And then the volume and how loud I say it. I could scream and I thought we was going to have supper at 5 o'clock. I definitely wouldn't get by with that. <laughs> I could say it again very low. I thought we was going to have supper at 5 o'clock. I might get by with that. The point I'm trying to make is, you know, the tone, the tempo, and volume of what you say, how you say it is very, very Important, And we need to think about these things, okay? And then the content is the actual, fourthly, the content is the actual words that we say, what actually comes out of our mouth. Now, it's very interesting that researchers say only 7% of what people respond to and make assumptions about take place through the actual words that we say. Only 7%. Now, I find, um, to me, these, these are profound percentages. Really? 7% is what we communicate with the words alone? And, and even though I've heard these percentages, I know them, but sometimes I, I tend to live in denial of them because I, I know there are times when if I really want to convey a message to Sam, I might be a little sharp or maybe a lot sharp. And, and Sam might look at me like he's questioning my attitude or something. And, and what I do in response to him is I change the look on my face and I change the tone of my voice. And then I'll innocently reply, innocently, all I said was, and then I'll repeat word for word what I, I just said, but with a different tone. I tell you, tone makes... So, so much difference how someone reacts to you. And, and they can tell what's going on in your heart by the harshness in your voice. It is, it is so important. And I think of one time when we were having, um, we, we would have a, a college and career Bible study at our home every Wednesday night. So a lot of young people there, and there was in particular one young couple. And they had a lot of, they had a lot of, um, conflict in their marriage. And um, this particular night, the, the husband was not able to be there. So the wife was there. And Sam was going through the study of Hannah and Elkanah, you know, where Hannah couldn't have children. And Hannah was really upset and she was crying. And Sam was reading through the passage and he got to the point where um, Elkanah was trying to console her. And he read this vo verse and, and it went something like, you know, why are you crying? Can't you see? I love you better than 10 sons. He was trying to console her. And Sam's voice conveyed that. It was, it was precious and it was really sweet. And this young girl pipes up, this young wife, she goes, oh, well, I didn't read it that way. And so she read exactly the same words and she goes, why are you crying? Can't you see I love you better than 10 sons? 
And see, she was coming from conflict and she was used to a, a really a harsh tone and a lot of criticism. And you see, it makes same words, but it makes such a difference in, in the way that we convey them. And we tend to communicate a whole lot more, I know I do, through body language and the sound of our voice than we do the actual words that we say. And communication, hey, it's a reflection of what's in our heart. And, and our heart controls our body language and it controls our voices and it controls our words. And, and that's why James 1.19 says, let every man be swift to hear, but slow to speak and slow to wrath. And, and what this tells me is I need to check my heart before I communicate. Motives matter and they really do show up in, in your heart and in your body language. You know, and again, we could spend a lot more time on this, but it is, you have to continually remind yourself, if you say something, and after you say it, you say, you know, why did I say it that way? Why did I say what I said? Why did I say it with the tone that I said it? And you begin to think on that. What it is, you need to remember that your mouth is an echo chamber of your heart. It comes from your heart. So it's a time to check up on your heart and see what your heart is. Again, going back to last night, all we've talked about, what am I focused on? What is the focus in my life? Is my focus on Christ? Is my focus on myself? Is my focus on getting this done or that done? Or is my focus on pleasing God with the words that come out of my mouth that they would, again, enhance the glory of my spouse? They would be the words of King Jesus that would come out of our mouths and reflect Him, or are they words that are very hurtful words uh, that are coming out of my mouth? So this is so, so important. Even these practical communication skills that kind of get little red flags to us of where we are in our relationship with our heart in God. Fifthly, let's go to the last one in this session, resolving conflict. And again, this is a huge one, a huge one. Resolving conflict, knowing how that we are to resolve conflict. Uh, it says we all form habits, the little word habits, with which we condition ourselves to respond in a particular way to a particular action. Now, when I say that, I think of the diagram that you've got there in your book, where it goes, and it, what I'm picturing is for every action, there's an equal and opposite what? Reaction, uh, that's the law of science. And you see at the point of action and reactions, either a point of solution or a point of crisis, it could be either one. Now, I realize uh, from my engineering training and studying this that this is a law of science, but I began to realize in counseling couples and dealing with families, it seems to be a law in relationships. Unfortunately, however the wife is acted upon, however the husband is acted upon, they react in the way they are acted upon. It's kind of like we used to raise dogs years ago, English masters. And if one dog barked at the other dog, the other dog would do what? Bark back. That's what dogs do. But dogs aren't made in the image of God. And we're made in the image of God and we're redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And we're not to respond in the way that we're acted upon. Now, this, let me just give you an example of this. I, I remember years ago, I can kind of like it's just happened in my mind yesterday. When we lived in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I would fly out of there very, very often. And uh, this was a time that uh, you could check three bags. You can't do that anymore without paying for them. But you could check uh, three bags. And so I kind of had it down to a science. When I would go to the airport, U.S. Air, I'd fly out of Charlotte, U.S. Air is a hub there. And I would take two boxes of, of materials so we could put them on book tables. And then I would take a suitcase, and that would be my three check bags. But then I would take two carry-on bags with me, too. So I remember this particular day. I walked up the U.S. Air check-in check -in counter, and I put my two boxes up here, my suitcase up here, my three check bags, and had my briefcase and a carry-on bag, another carry-on bag behind me. I had three check-ins, two carry-ons, and the clerk looked at me and said, uh, Sir, are these your check bags? I said, Yes, they are. Then he looked over my shoulder, kind of saw my carry-on bags. He said, Are they your bags back there too? I said, uh, Yes, they are. He said, How many do you have? I said, I have two. He said, Well, you have to pay $55 for each one of those bags if you carry them on. I said, Do what? He said, You're going to have to pay $55 for each one of those two bags if you carry them on the plane. And I began to realize that he was treating me very unfair. In fact, I pointed to him and I said, listen, I'm a U.S. Air frequent flyer. I do this all the time. I've never, ever had to pay for my carry-on bags. I said, there's people down there carrying carry-on bags. They don't have to pay for them. I said, what you're doing is not fair. 
Then he looked at me and he smiled and he said, you of all people ought to know that life isn't fair. And you say, why did he say that? Because on my ticket it had Reverend Samuel Wood. He knew I was a preacher. I thought, when I left that day, I thought I'm going to take Reverend off of my name, you know. Uh, but I, I thought to myself, he's been hurt at some point. He was after me and he was going to try to make me pay for those two bags. Now, being the choleric that I am, I went into action. <laughs> and I said, sir, what's your name? And I said, is your supervisor here? I said, listen, I'm a, a frequent flyer. I said, I'm going to write a letter to U.S. Air. I'm going to tell them about this incident. What was I trying to do to him? Intimidate him. I was trying to intimidate him to get my way. One of the things we'll do when we get into conflict is intimidation. We'll try to intimidate that other person to get what we want. I tried to intimidate him to death. He went back. He said, my supervisor's not here. He said, you can report me if you want to, but I'm charging you for those two bags today. Intimidation didn't work. So I moved to the second area. And I had another plan. I looked over his shoulder and I saw some packaging tape. I said, sir, can I borrow your packaging tape? And he said, why do you want to borrow my packaging tape? I said, because I'm going to tape one of my carry-ons to one box. I'm going to tape the other carry-on to the other box. Then I only have three bags. I thought it was a pretty good plan. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm not making this up. This really happened. And he looked at me and he said, you can't do that. I said, why can't I do that? He said, because I'm not going to give you my tape. That's exactly what he said. I tried intimidation. I tried manipulation. It didn't work. And so I went to plan three. You say, what's plan three? Plan three is ventilation. I got mad. I really got upset. I guess if you could have seen me in that airport, you saw steam coming off my bald head. And I let him know I wasn't happy about what he was doing. And I ended up walking away from there, and I didn't have to pay for both bags. I did end up paying for one, which wasn't fair either. Then I went down to the gate to wait for my plane. And I began to sit there and think about what just had happened. I thought to myself, I'm going to get on this flight. I'm going to fly for an hour. I'm going to have a preacher meet me at the other end of this flight, and I'm going to have to look like I filled, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And I thought, I don't feel too filled with the Holy Spirit. And God began to get all over me. And God began to say to me, you know, you responded to this man in the way anybody that's not a Christian would have responded. Just like the world would have responded. You had a chance to be a testimony and you blew it. You know what I did? I began to argue with God. But God, it wasn't fair what he did. God, that wasn't fair how he treated me. And God began to, to remind me how unfair Jesus was treated, and he was perfect, amen? And we are to follow in his steps. And I, I began to think about that, and God convicted me, and I had to, had to pray and ask God to forgive me because I had a chance to be a testimony, not react like the world would react, react like I should have acted, uh, reacted as a Christian, and I didn't do it. So I prayed, and I asked God to forgive me, and, and, uh, but I bring all this out to say this, which if we're not careful, that's the tools that we use. In conflict, we'll try to intimidate the other person. We'll try to manipulate the other person. If that doesn't work. We ventilate and we scream. We do whatever we can to get our own what? To get our own way. Now, I, let me just stop and say this and remind you too. Last night, I said if we're living covenantially, what that means as a husband and wife is you're willing to daily die to yourself for the good of the one you're in covenant with. A daily death of self. And the only way I'm going to daily die to myself is to continually in my mind get a fresh view of the cross of Christ to remind myself of how Christ died for me and of his sacrificial love. One of the verses that really has meant a lot to me over the years and we actually I think had our boys at one time memorize this verse is in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 where it says, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, a blessing, knowing that you're there unto call that you should inherit a blessing. Not rendering evil for evil, or that word railing means accusation for accusation or anything like that, but a blessing. And you see that little diagram in your workbook. It uh, kind of depicts 
a cycle of cursing. And what happens is what I've been saying most of the time in most relationships, if you're cursed, you curse back. Have you acted upon? You react back. And you have this continual cycle of cursing evil for evil. But what God is saying is we need to break this cycle. When somebody curses you, don't curse them back, but give them what? A blessing. Now, I want to say again here tonight, uh, today, I want to remind you, you won't give them a blessing if it's all about you. If you're not dying to yourself, you will not bless that other person back. I can remember times in a marriage where I would say something, unfortunately, harsh to Debbie. And she would say something sweet back to me in response. And I'm thinking to myself, how in the world can you respond that way when I just said what I said? Don't give me a blessing. I'm sort of thinking to myself, don't bless me that way. Argue with me. It's time to get in a fight, right? <laughs> so she blesses me back. You know what that does? It opens the door for conviction in my heart. And it opens the door for God to begin to work on me and say, see? See how Debbie responded to you? She blessed you. Even though you were harsh to her, even though you said those things to her, she blessed you you back. You know what that does? It opens the door for her to inherit a blessing back, to break that cycle of cursing. I love this verse. I love this verse. Just a tremendous, tremendous verse that we can remind ourselves that we are not to respond in the way that we're acted upon. We're to bless that other person. There's a couple books that are very, very helpful in regard to this. One of them is called War of Words. And I pick that book up about once a year and I thumb back through it where I've highlighted it and just remind myself of some of the tremendous truths in this book. It's one of the best, if not the best, book on communication I've read. A very, very helpful work book in helping us remind ourselves that we are to be good stewards of the words that God has given to us and what comes out of our mouth that it might be a blessing uh, to those around us. Tremendous book. And then if uh, the book Uprooting Anger, I deal with a lot of people that have anger problems and more of a tendency to get angry easily. And this has been a very, very helpful book. And if, you, if that's you and you say, I get angry, quick to anger, and uh, this would be, I believe, a very, very helpful, helpful book, I believe, to you too. Let me just end out this session by looking at these two circles uh, that we see there of, of what I call a circle of influence. And you see the inner circle. It's a, a smaller circle. Then you have an outer circle uh, that uh, is bigger than that inner circle. Now, the inner cer circle uh, is, uh, we might look at that inner circle of influence, and we can say that inner circle of influence is either a godly influence or an ungodly influence. We all have an influence. The question is whether it's godly or whether it's, ungodly. Now, the only way it's gonna, we're going to have a godly influence is our focus is on God. We have to be continually in our life focused, have our focus, our heart focused on God where we are loving Him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. But too often, most Christians, I would say the majority of Christians, are overwhelmed by this outer circle that's a circle of worry and anxiety. And when you worry and when you're anxious, your focus is not on God. Your focus is on who? On you. It's on yourself. And so often when we have this focus of worry and anxiety, it shrinks down this inner circle of influence, this godly influence that God wants us to have to be salt and light to those around us. <laughs> and what God wants to happen in our life is for this inner circle to overtake this outer circle of worry and anxiety, where we're focused on ourselves, that we might at all times be focused on God. Again, going back to last night, that we might have the godly influence that He wants us to have for the glory of God, that we might again have the transparent, open, unashamed relationships that God wants us to have, certainly for His glory and for our good. Uh, there's a book I think I've got on the end of this as we close this out called What Did You Expect by. Um, uh, Paul Tripp, another great book by uh, Paul Tripp. And I love the title. What did you expect when you got married? You got two sinners. You put them together in a closed space. It's going to take a lot of grace. Take a lot of grace. A lot of death to self. Very helpful book. And you might want to check it out too. There is a project to do here. And uh, I don't think we've got time uh, to stay on our time. We've got about a 10, 15 minute break. 
and we're going to have a split session where I'm going to meet with the men in the auditorium. Debbie's going to meet with the ladies here. And, uh, but there is a project here. If you want to get started on that, look at that. I hope you'll start getting started on that. If you don't finish it, maybe you can uh, finish it later this afternoon. Talk about it, as Debbie said, when you go out tonight, if you have some time together uh, on a romantic date and reflect on some of these things. And I think this will be uh, so, so beneficial to you. Let me have a word of prayer as we close out. And then we're going to take about a 10, 15 minute break. And we're going to start back on these separate sessions. Father, thank you for this time. In your word, I thank you for your truths. I thank you for your precepts, your promises in the word of God that help us to have marriages that can reflect the glory of God, that can be a picture of Christ and his church. And so, Father, help us again. I pray for every couple here today, Lord, that we have not just come to be hearers only, but we've come to be doers and to put into practice the things that we've heard for your glory, for your honor, and for your praise. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. And amen.